assignments. Social contract violates the NAP. Also uh, combined with uh, the Division of Student Affairs and other program people like history director, of course. Of, uh, we're uh, very happy to have with us uh, Professor uh, Carl Sutler to present his research, um, which is extremely timely, uh, kind of dealing with uh, issues of uh, youth and issues of crime and punishment. And the title of his presentation is The Way I See It uh, Reframing Black Youth in Racial Justice. So let me provide a little bit of a background on Dr. Stepler. He's assistant professor of African American history in the Department of History here at FAU. And the talk that he's going to be uh, having today is going to be uh, based on a forthcoming book, The Hell of Presumably Criminal, which is a large uh, project that he's been doing in the New York City area with lots of archival work that's kind of gone to that. His research interests include African American history, 20th century history, uh, histories of crime and punishment, which is what we're we'll talking about today histories of uh, childhood and youth, and also sport history as well. Uh, he has a PhD from Indiana University, and please join me in welcoming Dr. Uh, Charles Sutter. Okay, thank you for the stuff. And I think the elephant in the room. How many points your professor has been given that? Thank you um, to my colleagues who showed up. Well, thank you to the Peace, Justice, and Human Rights Initiative for existing, right? For being a thing. Um, this is going to have to be copy. Um, thank you to Dr. Campbell who showed up, and Robert, that got local Boca folks here. Thank you all for uh, coming out. This is really my first time giving a talk on campus since I gave a job call. And uh, so a lot of folks, a lot of students aren't familiar with who I am. Um, Dr. Roper just did a pretty good introduction, right? Um, but I know normally when I'm walking around campus, I'm not a student, so I just kind of blend in pretty easily. I'm a professor of history, um, but I study, you know, I study crime. I teach fun classes like sports history. I'm teaching the sports history class this semester. Um, so that was pretty quickly. Um, but I say all that to say my interests, as fun as they might seem, sometimes get really, really impressive, right? So part of part of what we're going to learn about in this talk is that, you know, everybody's always like, oh, man, you study race and crime, you study youth and crime. It's timely. Part of my job as a historian is to show that it's always been timely, and there's hardly ever been a moment in which it wasn't, right? Um, so what I wanted to do with the talk today was, this is, I'm, I'm treating it as my first unofficial book talk, if you will. I'm in the production phase of the book. The book is coming out this fall. And I wanted to try something with today's talk that I'm rarely able to do. Most of the time, the research talk like this, we kind of take one new argument and kind of dive in. Here today, I'm going to give an overview of what the book is about. Um, we can spend some time talking about so many arguments that we about the book. But, um, I'm really here to talk about the big argument of the book, right? What's kind of at the crux of the book, um, what I saw when I started writing this book, and the big infamous question, so what? Right? It's a question that I always ask my students. It's a question that is really, really difficult to answer. You study the 1930s to the 1960s, Professor Tubler, so what? 
right? It's ultimately going to be at the core of today's talk. And so to begin, I do want to start with an antidote that comes straight from the text. Can we dim the lights a little bit if possible? Mm -hmm. so we can shift. Is that okay for you guys? Mm -hmm. All right. I'd rather you see that the slides and actually see me. So I'm going to read this antidote straight from the book. It's coming straight out of the book into the introduction, and we'll talk about what's going on. I just got mixed up with some jerky kids. David Campanella told the police when he was arrested for his role in a Queens brawl. According to the police reports, the 15-year-old son of the former Brooklyn Dodgers catcher, Roy, was one of six boys involved in a fist fight in the vacant parking lot of a bowling alley as roughly 30 boys from 14 to 20 year old all looked on. No weapons were involved, no injuries were reported. Media coverage of the incident varied as the young Campanella was subjected to legal proceedings for the melee. Still, even with his well-known surname, the black youth faced tremendous hardship in both the court of justice and the court of public opinion. The first public accounts of the parking lot scuffle were printed by a New York newspaper, right? The New York Times and the New York Journal Tribune. And the photograph here displayed was one that actually came out in the New York Journal Tribune. And as you can see, the various headlines that were printed were quickly mentioned his name. There was not much discrepancy in the terms of what happened on this February 23rd, 1959. However, as the New York Daily's characterization of those involved to differ. One report that came out in the Herald Tribune said that David entered the Maplewood bowling alley and he issued a challenge to a group of white boys to come out and fight. In accordance with the police report, David Campanello was one of the leaders of the Chaplains, which was a Queens gang of, the, of Black and Puerto Rican youths. The reason for the clash, at least according to the Herald Tribune's report, was that the Chaplains had been peaked over their territorial rights in Flushing and they felt that they were being taken over by this unidentified rival gang. That unidentified rival gang was the Champions, which was a group of white guys who resided in the same neighborhood as the Chaplains. The New York Times coverage of the incident proclaimed that the Champions were said to have called the fight one week earlier. And they wanted to protest the presence of some of the Black and Puerto Rican youths who were moving in on their territory. The champions considered the bowling alley their territory and engaged Campanella and some of the guys when they entered the Maplewood's bowling alley. One of the white guys who fought against the chaplains was a guy named Michael Neal, and he told police reporters, quote, we were lounging around the bowling alley when Campanella and his two friends walked in. Campanella did all the talking. He wanted to build up a rep, you know, a reputation in the neighborhood, and wanted three of us to fight him and his guys. The three of us said we would, and we did. Ultimately, 14 youths between the ages of 15 and 20 were booked at the Flushing Precinct for this fight, and they were all paroled to their parents' custody, except for David. The police escorted David Campanella to the Bronx Youth House, and they did not release him to the custody of his mother, Ruth, who showed up to pick up her son. They didn't tell her why, and young Campanella was again housed overnight at the Bronx Youth House. Later, it was learned that David was detained for his role in the skirmish because he admitted that he had robbed the drugstore one week prior. A domestic relations judge explained to David that, quote, you must understand you have been found a juvenile delinquent. And if you get into further trouble and are returned to the children's court, you have my word, boy, you will be dealt with very severely. Following the two and a half hour hearing, David was let go with a warning. His mother told reporters, this is going to break his father's heart. Roy Campanella. Um, anybody know who Roy Campanella is? Oh, who's he, he was a catcher. That's right. For Brooklyn yeah. Dodgers. Brooklyn Dodgers. Right, okay. So he's one of the first black major <coughs> league ball players, right, to break the color line. He comes on to Brooklyn Dodgers the year after Jack. And during his time with the Dodgers, he worked closely in New York City to help curb juvenile delinquency. In an interview with Jet Magazine, Campy explained why it was important for him to do this kind of work. He said, quote, for years I've been lecturing in the YMCA, the boys clubs, the kid groups about walking the straight and narrow. I felt I was making a contribution towards solving a really serious problem in American life. But like, but like any father, Roy was forced to re-examine the whole picture of juvenile delinquency 
when he faced the problem firsthand. After his son David was released, Roy told the New York Times that everything else compared to this was nothing. The Campanella scolded their son for his, mis for his misbehavior, and at the same time, they understood the role of his reputable status played in the situation. Defending her son in court, Ms. Campanella affirmed that the charges were blown out of proportion because of his name, and their attorney agreed. Objecting to the high bail the Campanellas were forced to pay, William O'Hara told reporters that, that he wondered what would have happened to the boy if his name were not the Joneses. Though it was difficult to know for certain to what extent his family name played, the press openly admitted that his name did have a role in it. At the time, the managing editor was of the New York Times with a guy named Turner Catledge, and Turner Catledge said, quote, it was not the purpose of newspapers to prevent crime or to sell any philosophy to the public. Unrelenting to the sentiment that the press was obligated to give the public facts, in reference to the Campanella case, Catledge stated, we in New York have much less to apologize for if we didn't print the name. Names do make news. A part of why that's a big deal it's actually against the law to print names of juveniles who are arrested for any crime whatsoever, right? It's also against the law to run their images. So part of why his name and his image showed up in the media reporting was absolutely because of the no. So ultimately, all of the charges are dropped for the 14 used for that parking lot altercation, but for David, he ended up picking up these juvenile delinquent charges for his role in robbing the drugstore. The domestic relations judge at the time who was working the case was a woman named Sylvia Lee, and she told David that I don't, or she, she explained to the Campanella family that she didn't expect him to get any special treatment or sympathy as the son of his father, but he should get the same chance as any other boy. And Justice Lee was right. David Campanella did deserve the same chance as any other boy. And though the coverage of the case varied, Campanella's actual experience with the juvenile justice system was actually right in line with what many black youth encounters with the carceral state in the mid 20th century looked like. David had all the interests of all the boys his age. He played sports, he liked to sing. And prior to this incident, he had never gotten in trouble. Justice Lee, the judge overseeing the case, actually writes that the things that got him in trouble were not typical of his behavior. Nevertheless, his attitude toward authority <coughs> reflected a familiar distrust that many youths of color retained. They didn't trust the system. But a Washington Post editor asked the big question, why, right? Even the scars of his race, was how I will explain, right? Even the scars of his race must have been slighter for him since his father was so conspicuous an example of how even rooted prejudice can be overcome by merit and personality. Right? So he had a good life. What was it about David, young David Campanella that didn't fit this kind of profile of what it meant to be a juvenile delinquent? He wasn't suffering from parental neglect. He lived in a very favorable environment. And still, people were forced to deal with this question, right? Why did David become a delinquent? Presumed criminal tries to answer this question. For David Campanella, and toward a thousands of black youths like him who find themselves navigating a justice system that is constantly being shaped and reshaped by extension, never revision, and by punishment, never prevention. Cautiously throughout the monograph, I use the labels black youth and juvenile delinquency. It is important to understand that these can be taken in very different light depending on their social setting, right? So when I say black, I am refer I'm using it much like the proper noun African American, but I'm also employing it to those of, that are connected to the African diaspora, right? So when I'm talking about Harlem in the early 20th century, we're talking about black Caribbean folks as well as African Americans. When I say youth, I am referring to men and women up through their early 20s, even though we know in legal proceedings, this varies across race and gender. And when I say juvenile delinquency, I generally refer to antisocial behaviors or criminal acts that have been categorized by the state. <laughs> so I began the monograph in the 1930s. Right, New York City, like most cities, was continuing to work its way back to normalcy after the stock market crash. 
Harlem, whose renaissance was disrupted by the Great Depression, was still considered this kind of Negro capital of the world, right? Within the greatest city in the world. Conversely, the city view still found itself in an urban space with institutional resources that were lacking. They lacked an education, they lacked an economics, health, recreational opportunities, and the city's resources were drained because of the Great Depression. Consequently, many youths, especially black youths, found themselves entering the criminal justice system for the first time. And this too was a system that was sort of at a crossroads. The first chapter of my book starts in the 1930s and it starts with the story of this woman that we see in this picture. Her name is Jane Boland. She is the first African-American woman judge in United States history. And she's appointed to the Domestic Relations Court in 1939. I start with Boland for all kinds of reasons. One, it's a pretty big deal, right? We're talking about the 1930s, we're talking about a black woman, we're talking about a judge, right? A position of power in a city. But it's a big deal because of the position that she's given. Domestic relations at the time oversaw all juvenile delinquent cases in New York, right? So ultimately, LaGuardia appoints her because they, he feels she could be a little more fair about assessing the number of black and brown youths who were being brought forth before the criminal court system. But what was also important was that Bolin often administered a brand of justice that recognized that the racism and structural inequalities that black youths were facing were impacting the decisions of the lives of that these kids were leading. And this matters because juvenile justice, right? Um, I always like to ask the question, how many of us have been in the juvenile court because of something bad that they did? We don't have to answer that one today. Um, but, but ultimately, there's no jury, right? The judge is the, is the end all be all for juvenile cases, right? And so to have a black woman ultimately as the dictator of your sentence meant a lot for black kids in New York City. So much so that there were kids being arrested and telling the cops, hey, just make sure we get that lady judge, right? Because they were sick and tired of going before a white man judge, right? Who felt that, that at least from the youth perspective, they felt they couldn't trust it. So there was a little more trust to be had here. And this marked a pivotal moment in terms of understanding how New York's narrative is somewhat different, but at the same time, the same. So then I moved the story, I moved the narrative away from the system, right, if you will, and into the streets. I look at Harlem's home front during World War II, and I look particularly at the 1943 uprising. So Harlem in 1943 joined a series of rebellions across the country, and this one was a specific kind of response to systems of discrimination against segregation, and in particular against police brutality in the 1940s. It was a riot, if you will, right, that was sparked by a black military officer who was shot and killed by a white policeman. And the public <laughs> protest called attention to the plight of black New Yorkers in the 1940s, especially young Harlemites. The excessive policing that was used to quell this uprising is something that had a lasting impact on black and brown communities right, especially in New York City. It agitated any kind of cordial relations that the police attempted to cultivate in the 1930s, right? So you're talking about from 1939, Mayor LaGuardia appoints this black woman judge. Black people in Harlem are ecstatic and they love LaGuardia. 1943, the police come into Harlem to stop this uprising with a use of excessive force. Four years later, black people hate Mayor LaGuardia, right? Mayor LaGuardia is arguably one of the most complicated figures in New York City history. Um, but for me in particular, his narrative is important because of how young people then start to view the behaviors of police, right? Um, by the 1940s, the tale of that young people did not trust police, right? They didn't see police as a protective force, but as a disruptive force in their city was cemented into their lexicon, right? There was no longer this idea that police were there for protection. In fact, the young people in particular believed that police were there for nothing more than abuse. The two subsequent chapters, right? So I start with looking at the juvenile justice system, 
I then move into streets and talk about police community relations. The next two chapters are really about, are, are really theoretical, right? Um, I talk about the constructions and the deconstructions, if you will, of youth race and crime in New York City. And these are important, right? Because these are, these are going to be the actors who some people might say have a say in who is considered criminal or who can be shaped who's presumed criminal. So we're talking about folks like politicians. We're talking about print media. We're talking about the media in general. We're also talking about social scientists. We're talking about athletes. We're talking about celebrities, right? They all have a say in the public discourse on youth crime. The picture here is actually one of the first police athletic leagues in New York City, right? Um, the police athletic league was kind of this, uh, anybody familiar with how, right? What's the police athletic? Uh, I just know it from the baseball standpoint. It was a, basically a state-sponsored team where you interact with uh, either ex-police officers or current police officers. Right. So ultimately, they use organized play, right, as sort of this idea to try to build a relationship on really in how young people are going to view the police, right, in their community. Right. They wanted to see them as friendly. Right. Police Athletic League becomes known by its acronym PAL, right, and they are supposed to believe that the young people should view the cops as such. They want them to be their pals, right? Um, so these are the kind of interactions that I start talking about in the middle of the book, right? Because these, to me, have the most lasting impact on who is presumed criminal. In New York, after the war, just like after any war, there's all this kind of heightened publicity, if you will, about crime waves happening. And a crime wave takes place after World War II in New York City, but it's much more fabricated than it is factual. As the crime wave sensationalism plagued the city after the war, the base surrounding its, the legitimacy of its rhetoric, its causes, and its impact on the community, as well as prevention plans of how to stop it, transpired. In this moment, black crime discourse reestablished itself in, the, in very similar vein to what went on in the, during the progressive era, right? So we really start talking about it's the social factors that are leading people to commit more crimes. Um, but in the black community itself, right, black folks are saying there are no more crimes being committed in the black community than anywhere else, right? So there's sort of this combative narrative, right? Black folks are saying there aren't more crimes. White people are saying, look at the arrest rates. Black people are getting arrested in enormous numbers. They must be those who are being considered more criminal, and it's because of their impoverished condition, right? Um, so it's sort of this double-edged sword. On the one hand, police arrested black youths in particular in higher numbers, which reinforced this racialized perception of the crime wave, and then that crime wave was then mutually reinforced by New York City's print media outlets, um, which then would be influencing how the police were responding, would influence how social scientists were publishing their own research, and it would also influence the larger public perception on who was actually considered criminal. By the 1950s, there was little doubt that youth crime became a nationwide concern, and it warranted the attention and the resources of any who were willing and able to address the problem. When the United States this is another moment, right? This is probably the second moment in the U.S. history in which they actually commit fully to curbing youth crime. The first time would be in the Progressive Era, and what we saw out of that was the, the establishment of the juvenile court system, right? Um, in the 1950s, we see almost, in today's age, it would be like millions of dollars going into juvenile prevention programs. Um, here, I dissect the effectiveness of those anti-delinquency efforts. Um, because what we know is that the money is coming down from a national level, but by the time it makes it actually into black communities in particular, right, they have the penny left over. This is that moment in which a lot of white juvenile delinquency are <coughs> on the scene, right? Have rubble without a cause. You have this kind of worry of this kind of white anti-social behaviors that are coming up, right? They're tied to comic books, right? Kids are acting out. Our white kids are acting out because they're reading comics and they're thinking differently. Um, so there's a lot of money that kind of trickles down, except a lot of that money actually doesn't make it into the poor black community. Um, so in fact, what you see is implementation through organizations like the Harlem YMCA, and they actually <coughs> hire professional athletes like Jackie Robinson, like Roy Campanella, who are both seen there so that they can actually cash in on some of those resources, right? 
but they know if they have Jackie running a summer camp at the Harlem YMCA, kids are going to show up in big numbers, right? Um, but beyond just kind of these large institutions, what we also know was that there were there was underground organizing that's often left out of the historical record, right? So there was a group in Harlem known as the Harlem Young Citizens Council. There was a group of young people who called on Harlemites and any New Yorker who was willing to listen to drop the term juvenile delinquency altogether and say we have to refer to it as our delinquency, right? There's nothing that the kids were actually doing to be able to shape the narrative around how young how youth crime was being portrayed. So they actually called on, right? So we we think about today's moment, right, of young people being active, right? That that has a very long history. In this moment, young people were actually calling on adults to drop the term juvenile delinquency completely and claiming ownership of their roles in it. Ultimately, what happens is there's just too many conflicting strategies, there aren't enough resources, and perhaps more importantly, a misuse of resources caused the efforts to fail in the 50s, and it reestablished the racial criminalization of youth crime that punished way more young people than they expected. And so I finished the book, or at least in terms of the chapters of the book, in the 1960s, for all kinds of reasons, right? Today marks, I think, what, the 50, 50th, right? Uh, anniversary from the Carter Commission, Carter Report, Doug? Okay, you think? Doug, I got it, basically, all right. Um, right, so a lot of people, so I remember when I sent the monograph out, people were like, Professor Smuggler, you're ending your monograph in 1964. You know the war on crime starts in 1965. Right? I was like, never heard of it. You know? <laughs> I know the war on crime starts in 1965, right? But I could not expand the narrative because I felt like it was opening another can of worms, right? If I, if I extended the narrative to 65, the narrative would have ultimately went all the way to 77, and then it would have went to 80. Like, it, it, it would have been never ending, right? This book would have, you know, became 800 pages, and nobody would have read it. Um, nobody probably going to read it anyway. But I'm going to try to tell them. No, but uh, um, so so it was a very strategic ending in 1964 um, for that reason. But really, by the 1960s, ultimately, I'm making the case that efforts to create a fair and impartial juvenile justice system gave way to systematic and institutionalized racism. Right? There's no way of understanding the war on crime as anything but a racist fight against black people. Um, and unfortunately, we know this, right? So I use the case study of the Harlem Six in the last chapter. Um, the Harlem Six were six young African-American boys who allegedly stabbed this white woman shopkeeper in Harlem. Um, they all go to prison or they all go to jail for at least nine years. Four of them were released after the ninth year, one's released after the tenth year, the other one's released in 93. All of them are under 18 years old when they get arrested. Um, even the guy who was paroled in 93, on his parole records, it was actually documented, like, his listed charges were TBD, right? Um, he sat in jail as a 16-year-old in 1964 and comes out in 1993, right? Um, with charges that were listed as to be determined. Something to think about, right? And so, again, I talk about this moment as sort of, by the, by the 1960s, there is this, this open war in terms of how forces are kind of tackling this issue, especially around youth crime. In New York City in particular, 1964, we see the first move to have stop and frisk be put on the books, right? It's still around today. Um, we see no-knock legislation. Ultimately, what it did was it gave police the rights to go into uh, people's homes without having to actually knock, right, to give warning, right, um, so they could just knock on the doors. And we know that these kind of anti-crime laws contributed to higher arrests in black neighborhoods. Its youth would bear the brunt of these inordinate police practices, and thus they endured the stigma, and the, of, if you will, of criminality. And so to wrap up, right, so we can, I can kind of open this floor. Yes, my forthcoming book, Presumed Criminal Examines How the Juvenile Justice System, and its associated authorities contributed to racialized disruptions in youth criminality from the 30s to the 60s. But so what, right? 
And this is important because I do believe that presumed criminal offers timely historical context for contemporary debates around youth, race, and crimes in the United <coughs> States. For all its singularities, black youth criminality resonates as a national concern. However, so few are actually willing to accept the reality of their plight. Psychologists have determined that black boys are seen as older and less innocent than their white counterparts. Here is kind of a, this was from 2014, Donnie and Phil Goff at the time he was at UCLA. He has since moved on to John Jay College and started the Center for Policing Equity. Um, but in this study, Goff and his co-authors actually were trying to determine how much childhood actually served as a protective buffer from the criminal justice system for black kids. And so ultimately they found, and black boys in particular, ultimately what they found was that not only did black boys, not only were black boys seen as less innocent, but they were also perceived as being more responsible for their actions, right? And they were being, and they were more appropriate targets for police violence, right? So here are the psychologists of today putting forth this evidence. We have economists of today who have found that race trumped class, at least when it comes to the incarceration of youths in the United States. This was 2016. Um, a guy named Derek Hamilton, who's a professor of economics at the U School, two of his colleagues at Duke, end up doing this study. So what they did was they followed the National Longitudinal Survey of Youth from 1979 to the present day. And what they found was that in recent decades, rich black kids were actually more likely to have spent time in prison than poor white ones. In fact, what their numbers show is that around 2.7% of the white of the white kids who were actually documented in the study spent 2.7% of the poorest white kids documented in the study actually spent time in prison, compared to roughly 10% of the most affluent black kids. Right? Um, and to have been considered affluent here. You had to come from a household that had a combined income of over $69,000. Right? So it's not necessarily the most affluent, but with that in perspective, <coughs> even the poorest white kids, right, 2.7%, the most affluent black kids, roughly 10%. And we know that social media is a thing today, right? Black youths of the 21st century regularly articulate their own encounters with police violence or with the carceral authorities coming from the state. Anyway, and what we know is that even with this being recorded, right, um, I mean, you can kind of see what the numbers are telling you here. When asked if they have experienced harassment from police or if they know anybody, right, the numbers are pretty spot, right? African Americans are coming in at roughly 22% of actually having experienced it for themselves and 44% of knowing somebody who has versus the whites in we're coming in at 11 and 19, respectively. Um, where it really becomes a stark kind of question is, they were asked, how serious of a problem do you think the killing of black people by police in the United States is? 92% of the African-American community said it's an extreme, very serious problem. 48% of the white community agreed. And, by, and finally, what we know in this last number is, what about violence against the police, right? Um, 53% of the black community said that it's, I think it's a very serious problem versus 60%. And that 66 of the Hispanic uh, population picks out to me for all kinds of reasons that I don't actually know, um, but it's interesting. <laughs> um, and so what I hope is that all of these contemporary studies illustrate, or to me, what all of these contemporary studies illustrate is a much longer history of targeted policies and targeted strategies that have been in place since the 1930s that ultimately culminate in these kinds of numbers, that ultimately culminate in these kinds of results. So I hope after the book comes out fall that someone somewhere will read it and be convinced the same way that I was. Uh, and on that note, I'd like to open up the floor for questions, comments, concerns. So Carl, I'll, I'll, I'll begin the, the, the questions. You, you start off um, the discussion by 
uh, talking about your definition of what black is and what youth is, and you talk about youth as being individuals <laughs> into the early 20s. Um, the, the state of New York, of course, classified youths and adults in a very different way than that particular definition. So I thought maybe you might talk a little bit about how the state regarded youth and how that uh, impacted uh, the sorts of trends that you're looking at. Yeah, so. So in our minds, right, when we think about juvenile delinquency policy or when we think about who is considered juvenile delinquent, we almost instantly go to under 18, right? Um, but in actuality, that even that number has fluctuated over time, right? So youth is as much of a social construct, if you will, as race, right, in that regard. Somebody who was 14 in the 1700s isn't necessarily looked at as the same 14-year-old today. Um, and so regarding the actual police policing numbers, it's not until actually 1952 that we actually start documenting arrests of those under 21 years old. Um, prior to 1952, the categorization of youth in police records was anybody under 21, right? In 1952, that number switches to anybody under 18, right? And then we actually have the categorical breakdown from 18 to 21. A part of why that happens is that under 21 number just becomes massive. Right? And it's actually not telling us anything. Um, so if we're in fact we're going to categorize youth as being under 21, then what we're, we're, we're unable to know kind of where that target youth population is coming from with regards to the rest of them, right? And so even there, we start seeing kind of a fluctuation on who is considered young um, by the state. <coughs> and so even today, right, um, New York City is actually going through this race and age campaign and it's recently moved its it's number to 17. Um, because up until 2018, 16 and 17 year olds were actually imprisoned or jailed with adults, right? In New York. Um, it was New York and North Carolina were the two of the last states that actually imprisoned 16 and 17 year olds with adults, right? And so, so again, so for me, what that means is that there's this kind of buffer of youth, right? This is protection offered by youth status, right? And delinquency versus being designated a criminal. Um, and for me, what I found was that this number is very race, right? It's very class. Um, and so I extend that protection to black kids in particular that are well beyond the age of 18 because it's been an extension done to the white kids for decades. No question. Right. No. Yeah. I don't know if my question is going to make any sense, um, but this explosion in numbers um, of you know, youth detention, um, does it serve any uh, any purposes? I mean, it's helped by racism, we know that. But then, which purposes is it serving um, in the sense that? You know, the explosion in detention numbers after Jim Crow were serving very economic purposes, right? Today it's the private prison industry. Is there something of the sort that justifies this explosion in this in these years? In these years, right, in terms of in the, 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 the coverage, right, right of, of the study, I'd say yes, right? Um and and ultimately what it was. <laughs> I'm going to rewind before I answer this question, right? So the tale of juvenile delinquency or juvenile justice, right, in the history is known as sort of the very progressive era moment and then this very post-war moment, right? Um, with sort of this, this period of the late 20s, early 30s, kind of thing, like what happens, right? Um, and so what we know is that the establishment of the juvenile court system in the progressive era was done to actually as an Americanizing process of white immigrant youth, right? White immigrant youths were coming into this country and occupying city spaces, and they were getting in trouble for all kinds of reasons, right? But reformers were adamant that they weren't getting in trouble because they were inherently criminals. They were getting in trouble because they weren't yet adapted to what it meant to be an American country, right? Um, so what we see is that the juvenile court system is ultimately set in, in place as this protective system of white immigrant youths, right, um, for all kinds of reasons. Um, I actually believe that the same Americanizing tale is happening with black folks, right, except the stigma of being black and criminal 
actually results in more punishment and less reform, right? It's not necessarily an Americanizing tale of kind that we want to whiten you in the way that my immigrant is actually able to benefit from, right? And so for me, this is kind of a pivotal moment, and I think why it happens here is because of the demographic shifts in city spaces, right? World War II changes the demographics of urban spaces, especially in the north and out west, right? Um, and so it changes it dramatically, right? White folks start moving out to the suburbs, black and brown people start occupying city spaces in numbers that we hadn't seen before that, right? And so to me, that the juvenile court system actually isn't changing in that sense, but what's changing are the kids that are actually finding themselves in it, right? Does that answer the question? Oh, yes, absolutely. Okay. Um, I'm wondering if there is a, a difference. I, I mean, we know about the criminalization of black males specifically. And I'm wondering if any of the statistics going back pay attention to um, boys versus girls. Uh, obviously, black bodies generally are criminalized, but are there any nuances or differences? Absolutely, um, right. And so there is a, I want to say she's at DePaul, but she has a book coming out, Tara from UNC Press around the same time as mine that actually looks at the criminalization of black girls almost in an overlapping area. Mm -hmm. um, ultimately, what we do know is that a lot of what happens with black girls in particular is built around sexuality politics, right? In terms of the, the shifts in behaviors that black girls are showing tend to kind of be tied in ways that, or tied to sexuality in ways that black youths or black boys are tied to more violent behaviors, right? Um, and so to me, that's probably the biggest nuance that we see in the behaviors, right? Both are demonizing kind of traits, right? Both are looked at as being delinquent for different reasons. Um, but, but, but again, like for black males in particular, um, what we see is that they're, they're being, this is that moment that they're being tied to, especially at younger ages, being more violent or more prone to commit violent acts um, versus black girls who are seen um, as destitute, right? As dependent. Um, and very much so delinquent, but in a different kind of way. Um, forgive me if this is speculative, but um, did you see anything along the lines of like why, I guess, affluent, um, affluent like um, black boys or black kids come to the United States? Was, it, yeah. was there any explanation for why that was the case? Or? Normally it's guilt by association. Right? <coughs> um, it, it, it's ultimately what happens, right? Uh, police can't see class, um, is, right? Contrary to how you might dress, how you might carry yourself, right? It's, it's very difficult to see class. Um, that's why I open, you know, that's why, I, one, I like this kind of contemporary model and opening up with somebody like David Campanello, mm -hmm. right? Because David Campanello is not hurting for money, right? Like his dad is playing for the Brooklyn Dodgers. Mm -hmm. um, but yet he still finds himself kind of hanging out with the wrong guys, right? Because I got mixed up with this kid. But what we know that speaks to is that, you know, all kinds of residential segregation, right? So Roy Cantonella is living in Harlem at the time because he can't live anywhere else in New York City, right? Um, residential segregation, pigeons, you know, black folks to live in a particular neighborhood, right? So, so when the police come into the neighborhood, they don't know that this is for example, another time, yeah. right? And so ultimately, it becomes sort of this guilt by association. And to me, those are that's why I say this is a story for the David Campanellas of the world, right? Um, there are people who commit violent acts, right? Um, but most of the people who we think of as criminals actually didn't commit crime at all. Okay. 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 Or of the judicial system. So this, so so this study here that was done by uh, Derek Hamilton and his folks is actually by incarceration rate. Um, so these are actually people in jail. Right. So um, the judicial system. So it's not just the best, you know, like when they don't know what class they come from. True. The bias. In yeah. The well, and then we know, especially in terms of today, right? So again, because this is a study that starts in '79. We know that most black folks are in jail because they actually plead guilty. Um, so again, it, it, it's hard to actually distinguish the number between actual crimes committed and crimes that they say they committed, right? Out of fear that if they take it to court or they take it to trial, they're going to lose and actually be in there for a long time, right? And so, so I have this conversation all the time. Uh, my advisor kind of beat it into me during graduate school. It was like, don't rely on stats. 
right? Uh, for all kinds of reasons, right? Arrest rates don't are kind of a good measure of crime. Neither are incarceration rates, right? People are arrested for not committing, not necessarily for committing crime. People are in prison not because they commit crime, right? But those are really the only two numbers that we have that are measurable. So it, it becomes so difficult to actually use a number, use a stat to measure crime. Um, and so it's always important to kind of contextualize the numbers as much as you can, um, especially for non-historians who fall in love with rats. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, it's, um, but, but it's, it's so hard to kind of quantify crime, right? Too, too complicated. Yeah. I have a question about like the methods of policing. Some of the things you went over, like um, mm -hmm. like the broken windows. I don't know if you went over broken windows specifically, but like don't not, or, uh, no knock and then um, you know stop and frisk and stuff like that. Um, and and th those could be classified as like proactive forms of policing as, as opposed to like reactive, like responding. So when you say that like um, laws that allow for uh, an increase in proactive policing uh, maybe have an influence on higher incarceration rates because it like um, kind of inspires the officer to act. Yeah, absolutely, right? So, so it, it, it's hard to say that, you know, stop and press is ever gonna lead to less incarceration, right? right? Um, but I actually make the case early on in the book that some of the preventive policing measures actually also <coughs> lead to high rates of incarceration, right? Um, it's one of those things that because of, you know, organizations like the Harlem YMCA, because of organizations like the Police Athletic League, ultimately what happens is there is an extension of surveillance, right? And because of that extension of surveillance, you then start learning about certain behaviors that may or not, may not be being criminal, right? Um, so in the, in the 1930s, uh, there's an organization that comes um, within the police department called the Juvenile Aid Bureau. And their job is actually to document what are known as potential delinquents. That's it, right? That's what they label. 90% of the case studies of delinquency in New York City at the time are potential delinquents. Um, and, and so, so to me, the proactive policing that we see in Stop and Frisk, right, it's as obvious plain sight, right? You know, we know where they are actually doing this. We can actually trace this into black or brown neighborhoods um, in ways that we know they're not doing in white areas, right? That, that kind of plays a little number. But it's really that measure of preventive policing that I think also adds to this tale in ways that people have yet to kind of think. Are there any community organizations that work to counter repression, police repression? I'm thinking of ahead after your story, like the Panthers to the Oakland. Is there a equivalent of that? I'm curious to answer that. Yeah, so one of the ones that I mentioned kind of briefly in passing was the Harlem Young Citizens Council. Um, and these were kids, right? So ultimately, it was backed by a guy named Samuel Richardson, who was a business owner in Harlem. Um, but he was just putting the bill so that these kids could like have a place and space to kind of organize their own meeting. Um, and I'm trying to think of others that would would have come up. Um, there was a Harlem Young Citizens Council. There's oh, I mean, so the. <coughs> In the case of the Harlem Six that I talk about, um, all kinds of black communists are organizing around the police brutality in the 1960s, especially in New York City. Um, so, so one of the guys that, um, the, the attorney that worked the case is a guy named Conrad Lynn. Ultimately, he organizes their mothers, right? Um, and the mothers become kind of this voice to actually try to help free the Harlem Six, right? So there's, there's, there's this, and, and the Harlem Six case has kind of fell out of the historical narrative because 1964 is also the year that James Powell gets shot by Tom Gilligan, right? And Tom Gilligan ends, ends up leading to an uprising in Harlem in 1964. And so that takes away a ton of media attention. But folks like James Baldwin, folks like Conrad Lynn, right, are following the Harlem Six case and actually trying to give it credence because, it, again, it's a narrative that, that, that over, it, it, it extends so long, right? Um, by the time the case actually resurfaces in the 70s, it's not, act, it's not actually known as the Harlem Six anymore. It's known as the Harlem Four, 
because they were only actually grouping four of them, right? So even for us historians who are like, oh, I want to find all of the Harlem Six references in newspapers, right? <coughs> we lose the story by only following it as the Harlem Six because the media actually then portrays it as the Harlem Four, right? And the reason that the other two guys are kind of left off of the tail is because they ended up taking guilt pleas, right? So they ended up pleading guilty. Uh, so then it becomes, let's free the Harlem Four, but it's the same boys. Um, and so, so there's a lot of organizing around that case in the 60s. Um, and again, some of these are well-known historical actors like Baldwin, um, Conrad Lynn to a certain extent, there are guys like Lee Huntsler. Um, and then the mothers of those boys are super active in organizing to try to free their um, sons. I mean, the mothers are writing letters to the governor trying to grant clemency. Um, and so, yeah, so there's some words towards that. How closely associated is um, poverty with uh, like criminality? Like, is it is it so much more probable that someone coming from poverty is going to commit a crime than someone like? Is there statistics that show that you know the, the poverty differences make difference in whether you go commit a crime or not? Because it seems as though like the police presence in uh, black communities or black neighborhoods is associated with the people committing the crimes, but the justification, or not the justification, but the reason for them committing the crime is because of their circumstances. So now, so what I'm trying to say is that it's not necessarily that the police are being racist per se. They might have racist tendencies or be racist a little bit, but that they are trying to address the crime in the area, but the only reason why the crime is happening is because the kids are... Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, so, so it's funny. I, I looked at this conversation yesterday. Um, I with Professor Brown. Um, and so, um, yes and no, right? Um, we do know impoverished circumstances may lead to all kinds of kind of efforts to go around the system, right? Be resentful. Um, not necessarily be resentful, right? But 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 in the, in, in the, the poverty case, we're typically thinking about like property crime, right? Um, it's, it's very hard to make the case that poverty makes people quote unquote more violent, right? And so, so it's important to distinguish what kinds of crimes we're talking about in terms of the time and 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 so in impoverished neighborhood, are people more inclined to sell drugs, right? right. And, and that speaks directly to their inability to find work elsewhere, right? And so they have to make ends meet, perhaps, right? But we know in affluent white neighborhoods that white kids are selling drugs in very high numbers, right? right. Um, and, and so it's the policing of that behavior in those neighborhoods that ultimately leads to higher arrest rates. Um, so it's but, easier for police to address it in the low-income neighborhoods, and then why wouldn't police address it in the white neighborhoods if they're selling more resources? Um, <laughs> is, the, is the short answer there, right? Um, you know, we we know if you know a white kid from an affluent neighborhood gets locked up or gets arrested for for selling weed, he may or may not have access to lawyers that are going to make that cop like you know, in a way that the person in that poor urban neighborhood won't, right? And so access to resources in affluent neighborhoods actually get, you know, it's not necessarily seen as sort of as much of a problem, right? They don't target it nearly as much. Um, but but ultimately, I, I, I do want to make the case, right, um, that what we know is that in the 1930s, this tale is coming on the back end of people genuinely believing that black folks were biologically inclined to commit more crimes, right? So to shift the narrative to social kind of conditions that are breeding, quote unquote, breeding crime was progress, but it's not without problems, right? Because then the, the, the what was built into that argument is that people who live in poor neighborhoods are more inclined to commit crime, when that's actually not necessarily the case, right? There are plenty of people today who live in poor neighborhoods who don't know where to go buy guns, who don't know where to go buy guns. Not necessarily, don't know, but is it the case? Not necessarily, but is it the case? What do you mean? You said it's not necessarily meaning it doesn't follow necessarily, but is it the case that in poor neighborhoods there are more crimes? No. Uh, and, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. That's about the response to that. Yeah. Does that answer? Absolutely. Got time for one more question if anyone has one. Who wants to ask that last? Um, 
Well, I want to thank everyone for coming uh, this afternoon and also to thank uh, Professor Sudler for his talk. And we look forward to seeing the book come out. Thank you. <laughs>